Now we come on to the third section for immuno application. And we'll just jump right into the questions. Again, it's important to recognize that when we were learning all those sort of ground, you know, groundwork of cytokines and all that, most of the most of the post midterm material that you take in an immuno class is just going to be applying what you learned in the beginning and a few new things with regard to hypersensitivity, which we'll come to, and transplant uh, pathology, which we'll come to, and maybe a little, very very little immunodiagnostics. So if you can keep reviewing that pre midterm material, it's going to really pay off off in terms of your overall um, understanding of immunology, especially when you start to get to pharmacology when, again, you're just applying what you learn in that pre-midterm. So question number one is, your patient is suffering from a squamous cell carcinoma. Which of the following cytokines would most likely be secreted by this carcinoma? Now again, this is one of those types of questions where you don't have to really memorize anything. You just have to look at the answers and say which one of these is not like the other. It's really helpful in immuno uh, questions to think in those mindset or to separate it between B and T cells sometimes or to separate it between too much immunity and not enough immunity like we've talked about before. So essentially, which of these cytokines is not like the other? So TNF that's a Th1 cytokine. IL-1, that has to do with increasing the fight, right? Because INF and TNF work together. Uh, IL-1 is going to increase your, uh, is going to increase your fever. It's going to reset your temperature in the hypothalamus. And those two are going to essentially cause you to have more adhesion and more uh, inflammation. Interferon gamma, we've been through. That's a Th1 cytokine. Again, so all those three are going to be increasing the fight, increasing the boost of the immune system. So it wouldn't be likely for a tumor cell to want you to have a better immune system because your immune system is what's going to eliminate that tumor cell. So what's left? D, TGF beta. Okay, that makes a lot of sense because um, essentially what that's going to do is going to what? Let's try to think of the mechanism of how a tumor cell would be benefited by this. Well, TGF-beta is going to increase your AI regs, your regulatory T cells. So you're going to regulate the T cells and decrease the T cells. I would say that's probably the most likely. And then, of course, we also know that TGF-beta is going to decrease some of your ability to produce reactive oxygen species. Not so helpful per se with a tumor, but certainly Certainly, those reactive oxygen species are critical for fighting bacteria and other types of pathogens. Number two is, given the answer above, what is the most likely advantage the tumor gains by secreting this cytokine? Well, uh, I'm an idiot. I just answered my own question. Uh, number A is proliferation of AI T rigs, which we just talked about. That sounds like a very good answer. Okay, but let's look at why the other ones um, aren't correct. B is increased IL-4. All that is is just, again, it's pushing a Th2 uh, response, which could be kind of interesting for a tumor cell, but it's isotype switching uh, as well. So that's not as good as, uh, as the answer of... Um, of AI regs, okay? And again, IL-4 is not increased by an increase in TGF-beta. It happens to be another Th2 cytokine just like TGF-beta. Increase in IL-2, no, that's not increased by TGF-beta. And number two is IL-2 will increase, remember, uh, from what we discussed just a few minutes ago, is IL-2 is what takes this NK cell and makes him a I think the, the L is for leukokine activated killer. So IL-2 makes it an even better killer in terms of being able to uh, secrete those granzymes that, that lyses those tumor cells. So that's definitely not going to be the answer. And an increase in INOS, no, actually TGF-beta would decrease INOS. So not correct. Uh, number three is the laboratory investigations reveal that your patient um, has a double sorry, anti-double-stranded DNA, anti-Smith, anti-phospholipid, which is another word for that is lupus anticoagulant, and indirect um, immunofluorescence for anti-nuclear antibodies are also found. You'd expect the following complicating issues. So again, name the disease, name the pathology. I've essentially spelled it out for you. We're talking about 
uh, lupus, okay? So now you just have to think about what are the symptoms associated with SLE slash lupus. Malar or butterfly rash accentuated by sunlight, that's one of them. Yes, A is true. Number uh, B is recurrent abortions. Yes, that is also true of SLE patients. Sometimes even one of the presenting uh, symptoms or even uh, pulmonary edema can also be, uh, or uh, a fusion can also be a presenting symptom. C, joint deformities. Joint deformities tends to be descriptive of an arthritis of some type, be it um, rheumatoid arthritis or perhaps osteoarthritis. So that would not be correct. And D, all of the above, D is not correct, so um, due to C not being correct, so we are left with E, A, and B above. So we have malar or butterfly rash and recurrent abortions. And again, you know, these uh, specific antibodies, these are your normal sort of, uh, your normal functions of the body, and then in lupus you create an antibody to your own system, and then that's going to cause immunopathology. We'll get into what kind of, uh, how that, the mechanism of that when we talk about hypersensitivity reactions in just, just a bit. Four is, your patient's uh, complete blood clamp shows profuse eosinophilia. Okay, so they have a lot of eosinophils flying around. Now, this would not be due to, now, most of the time, uh, board exams don't like to use knots and negatives and things like that, but you do find them on, on course exams sometimes, so I threw that in there. This would not be due to what? So, when would you not have eosinophilia? All right, a, a bacterial infection. Right, you don't get eosinophilia with bacteria infections, so that's the right answer. But let's look at B, invasive parasitic infection. Ab, you know, wrong. No, you will get eosinophilia with an invasive parasitic infection. C, allergies. Yeah, you see eosinophils hanging around in allergies like we talked about. And D, Churg-Strauss syndrome, allergic granulo, um, granulomatitis. Now, uh, the t the one thing that you, know, you hear sometimes is that the board exams are, are shying away from eponyms like Churg-Strauss, but, uh, you know, my understanding and my experience has been that, that there still are eponyms on exams, so you always want to kind of know the name of, of a particular disease and also be able to know how to describe that disease and if there's another name for it that is not, um, that is not an eponym, you want to know that as well. So that just covers you there. Number five is you deliver a, uh, a newborn who is found to have X-linked skid. He is therefore deficient uh, in the following transmembrane protein. This is again just sort of straight up memorization and that, uh, let's look at that, is essentially the answer there is going to be C which is CD32. Now what we're describing here is X-linked skid, okay, and that's going to be um, with this CD32 molecule is going to be associated with the following cytokines. And this is what you get asked sometimes, you know, on an immunoclast, maybe not so specific on a board exam, but those, the IL cytokines that are associated with CD32 are going to be two. So let's just write it out. Um, it's almost, it's another laundry list, unfortunately, uh, but it is worth knowing because you can see how really devastating this particular X-linked skid is. So you're basically uh, going to be deficient in 2, 4, 7, 9, let's, and 15, and 21. So just for the purpose of review, IL-2, we know that's going to increase NK leukocyte uh, or leukokine activated killing activity. That's also going to increase the growth factor for your T cells all T cells. IL-4, isotype switching. IL-7 is that growth factor for your B cells, your T cells, your NK cells. IL-9, uh, I don't really know much about IL-9. I haven't studied IL-9, so I'm not going to pretend I know it. Uh, IL-15 is secreted, and it's going to increase with IL-12, and it's going to increase the chances of that NK cell secreting interferon gamma. And IL-21 is part of the stabilizing the Th17 response. Uh, so that's a Th17 response that's going to help you with uh, fighting fungal infections and, and infections of that nature. So you can see where you're, you're grossly deficient with regard to this, okay? 
the other aspect while we're at it, while we're talking about skid is, well, how's the patient going to manifest? They're going to be short of B cells, they get, so bacterial infections. They're going to be short of T cells, so cell-mediated immunity. So they're not going to be able to, to eliminate or to wall off, I should say, tuberculosis. They're going to be, you know, very similar to HIV, only you're going to have, you know, really no antibodies uh, to speak of. Another way, there's a lot of different ways you can get skid. Probably one of the more famous is the ADA deficiency, uh, and that's going to be, remember ADA, adenosine deaminase, uh, is an enzyme that is, uh, that is instrumental in purine metabolism. And when that's deficient, you get this sort of toxic intermediates that build up that are toxic to your T and B cells. So that's another way that you could end up with immunodeficiency. And of course, we all remember that was one of the first, uh, that was one of the first treatments that they had devised to be able to replace that for those patients, the boy in the bubble and, and all of that. You can also talk about, with regard to this signaling cascade in CD32 uh, and the cytokines, is the Janus kinase. Um, and I'm just going to say a quick word about it because it's becoming, um, first of all, it's, it's becoming more widely recognized that the Janus kinase, and there's a number of them, are instrumental. Sometimes they have a gain of function, so like the JAK2 is what's implicated in what they call polycythemia rubavera, where you get too many cells, right? And you get a cancer associated with that, where the proliferation, you have a lot of red blood cells, high red blood cell mass, and you don't have the proper hemopoiesis. But in this case, it's a JAK3, and it's a loss of function. And the Janus kinase, kinase makes sense. It's gonna basically give a, uh, it's gonna give a tyrosine, um, it's, or it's going to, sorry, give it time. It's going to phosphorylate. Um, it's going to phosphorylate the molecule. So here it, it, it essentially, sorry, here's the cell. You phosphorylate the molecule and then passes off to the STAT pathway, which is a transport, which then acts on the nucleus. So they call it the JAK STAT pathway. And then acting on the nucleus, and then of course, you know, it's a transcription factor to start the growth of, and again, remember we had these IL, uh, IL2C, I don't know it very well, 2, 4, 7, 9, and uh, 15, and 21. Okay, so JAK STAT pathway. Um, again, you want to, you want to remember that it's a double phosphorylation. You get a phosphorylation uh, initially and then to the STAT pathway and then the STAT goes to the nucleus. There's a great article in the New England Journal of Medicine that came out about mm, six weeks ago with great pictures if you want to look at that more closely. Number six is you are considering research project where you infect the earliest hemopoietic stem cells with HIV. First, you need to stimulate these cells to proliferate. So uh, what do you need? Uh, so you don't have to know anything about HIV. All you need to know is how do we grow hemopoietic stem cells at the earliest stage. And if you remember that the first growth factor for our little hemopoietic stem cell is going to be IL-3, and then he can go to either, either your monocytes, granulocytes, right, over here, um, or the myeloproliferative type cells, myelo or you can go to your lymphocytes. So that's T, B, and NK cells, all right? And so IL-3 is, gonna, is basically gonna go either way, and then from here it's IL-7, and then from here it's uh, CS, uh, CFF, GM, all right? And then it can go to G or M, granulocyte or monocyte, monocyte for, for monocytes and G for the granulocytes. And then don't forget our friend IL-5 is for eosinophils, which are also part of this little pool here. So why does that matter? It matters because if, you're, if your patient is depleted of a particular type of cell, we have drugs that are analogs or homologs, if you will, for these particular cytokines. And you can induce growth of those cells. Like for example, in the case of, uh, well, actually I think we'll come to it. Again, I don't want to give away another answer. Okay, number seven is your patient has a SLE, aka lupus. You shop for a clinical trial and choose a promising clinical trial that uses a drug that acts as an antibody to CD20. 
Now let's just think for a second. Okay, so if I say that something is an antibody to it, it means that it either, you know, it essentially renders it useless, all right? Either because you have an antibody and it's like trying to drag around this antibody or because you have an antibody and then that enables opsonization, right, by a macrophage or you have an antibody and that in, involves the NK cell being able to kill it because the NK cell has the FC uh, gamma R receptor. So essentially you are eliminating those cells when you target an antibody to it. Don't confuse that um, like, you know, I can have the tendency to do. Sometimes you'll have an antibody that stimulates something. So read the, care, the question carefully, but most of the time in drug targeting, it's an antibody that takes it out of the pool. When it's your own body forming an antibody, you could end up stimulating it. Let's use an example just to, just to make it clear, is that the disease of Graves, right? You have a antibody that pretends that it's like TSH, thyroid stimulating hormone, and it binds to the thyroid stimulating uh, hormone receptor um, in the thyroid, in your thyroid gland, and it increases the exp you know, it basically increases the production of your thyroid hormones, your T4 and ultimately T3. So that's a case where you have an antibody that has actually, you know, a gain of function, if you will, versus a loss of function. But um, in any case, the question I'm asking here is an antibody that eliminates, eliminates a certain type of cell by targeting CD20. So what does it eliminate? That's all it's asking is. And so the question causes you to think, well, geez, where is CD20? When, at what point, what stage in B cell development does CD20 show up on the B cell? And the answer uh, going through it is pre-B cell, okay? And what would that do? It would decrease, okay? We've already established that it's going to decrease. So again, we drew this out a minute ago, but you have pro, you have pre, pro-B cell, pre-B cell, immature, mature, slash naive. Okay, so this is CD19, this is 20. And remember, once you got 19 and it starts here, it goes, it's gonna be on there through, through the duration of the development. Same way with CD20. So where's the first place that CD20 shows up? It's on the pre-B cell and of course an antibody's gonna decrease it. Rituxan, we already talked about it. It's a great drug that, that targets this that I'm describing. By the way, when you take the amino class, I, I mean, I can't speak for every university, but, but you, you get tested on pharmacology, immuno, immunopharmacology when you take pharmacology or that aspect of it, not per se um, when you're focusing on the immuno aspect of it. And of course, in the step or board exams, they throw everything at you at one time, so you just have to integrate it, but we all know that. We expect that. Number eight, in question number seven, the B cells meet their death via, and I just sort of went over this, so there's a lot of different ways that a B cell can die, in this case, when it has an antibody attached to that CD20. And this is just generic for any antibody mediated cytotoxicity, okay? So A, NK mediated cell death, yes. B, opsonization and subsequent phagocytosis, yes, because remember the macrophages have those FC gamma R receptors. And C, complement mediated destruction. I didn't mention that, but that is also true because because of, uh, because of the immunoglobulins, right? Will activate complement, IgM, with the you know only takes one because it's pentameric it's very efficient but IgG okay so it takes a thousand molecules to get in the right conformation but you will activate the classical complement system and it can go all the way through the membrane attack complex so the answer the best answer would be D which is all of the above number nine is after carefully reviewing the research on the drug that targets the CD20 you discover that it can cause a deadly encephalopathy. Okay, so which, you know, which is uh, not exactly uh, breaking news here, right? If you're taking away an enormous component of your immune system, aka every B cell that has a CD20 receptor on it, then there's going to be some chances that there's a price to be paid due to this because you're obviously um, going to set yourself up for pathogens and they have shown you know encephalopathy unfortunately is is not uncommon
So alternatively, you find a drug that blocks BLYS from binding BR3. So what will this drug do? This is a memorization uh, question and it's not particularly high yield, but you might see it in an immunoclast. So essentially, BLYS, this is part of B cell regulation, by the way. That's what, that, that's what this is talking about. BLYS interacts with this BR3 is, is what happens. And you get this signaling cascade via the BR3 that prevents apoptosis. So that sounds a lot like cancer. If you can't, if the cell can't apoptose, then you have the immortal, you know, you have the immortal proliferation of that particular cell. You immortalize that cell. Immortalized cell, that sounds like cancer. So the answer is that if you block that BLYS, so you basically, the, the, let me just erase this quickly. So if you were going to immortalize a B cell, the way that that would do is B well IS and your little friend, his little friend BR3, they get together and they cause a signaling cascade and they say, live forever, live forever. Okay. Well, that is bad, right? Because <laughs> we don't want that in the case of a cancer, monoclonal cancer. So what you do instead is, this is immortal, all right? So what you do instead is you, you kill off this, right? So this drug blocks these two from getting together, and then voila, you get apoptosis. So that's an alternative mechanism. Again, it's not particularly high yield, but you know, it could be, there's some studies that show that, that some, of the, uh, some of the hemopoietic cancers can figure out how to, you know, play with this mechanism. So, you, so maybe it'll become more popular. Just like, you know, as we learn more, you get more questions on these, on these as, we, as we start to really understand the mechanisms. Number 10 is, your patient has chronic allergies. All right, so you prescribe a prophylactic drug that stabilizes mast cell membranes. The drug's active component is what? So this is a this is a memorization question again. So A antihistamine H1 H2 receptor antagonist. Uh, no, actually, that's the that's the one people like to go after. But look at the question carefully. It's asking uh, what drug stabilizes the membrane. No, antihistamines are just they block you know, your histamine uh, receptor, but they're not going to stabilize the membrane. So the answer uh, B is sodium uh, chromoglycate, which there's some different names for this, but essentially that's what the right answer is. And supposedly it, it basically, um, they don't totally understand the mechanism, or at least I don't, but it has to do with um, calcium channels and stabilizing that membrane. Interferon gamma, no, TGF beta, no, again, um, those interfering gamma has to do with cytokines and macrophages. It's not due to allergy. You don't see that in TGF beta. It has to do with, uh, like we talked about before, with regard to um, it can cause a Th17 response uh, with IL1 and IL or IL6, or it can cause an increase in in AI Tregs. So it's, it has nothing to do with the with the chronic allergies. Number 11 is your patient wants to marry a woman who has a beautiful basset hound, but he's allergic to animals. You recommend he try desensitizing allergy shots. The mechanism of action of these shots is based on an increase in which of the following. Again, this is not a particularly high yield question, but I think it's kind of interesting because people do go through this process. And uh, the understanding is, is that, uh, that let's go through it. So A, TH2 response, well, no, because remember, TH2 is going to increase IL-4, which is going to give you IgE. That's an allergy, if I've ever heard it. And then IL-5 is eosinophilia, which is also associated with allergy. So those two are not going to help you. Um, and then B is just another way of, of, of expressing answer A with IL-4 and IL-5. C is TH1 and IgG. That sounds kind of good because that's clearly not allergy. Okay, those are the TH1 cytokines have nothing to do with the allergy. So that's a pretty good one. And then AI regs would just reduce, would just reduce your T cells uh, and it would be T cell mediated uh, regulation. And so that's not going to be an accurate answer. So the answer is C. 
Number 12 is your patient has chronic idiopathic urticaria. So what does that mean? It's like just uh, randomly breaking out in hives. I have a friend, I used to be a commercial pilot, and, and he has this problem. And it's a problem for pilots because, you know, they don't want you on all these drugs for obvious reasons. Um, so you have to be, you know, it can be quite troublesome. And this is one of those questions where it depends on who you ask, okay? If you ask an immunology specialist, they will tell you that chronic urticaria is, um, is a hypersensitivity reaction, is a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction, which we'll come to, okay? Which is an antibody antigen mediated immunopathology. If you ask, um, you know, a lot of textbooks, they'll say, that it is a type 1 hypersensitivity. In other words, it's just like any other allergy. So the, the operative word in the, in the question is, is hives, urticaria, that is chronic. And that's a t uh, the answer would be a type 2 hypersensitivity reaction where your patient produces an IgG that is actually anti-IgE, thereby activating mast cells in a chronic manner. So it's actually, you take an IgE molecule, okay, and you're, you're constantly sort of activating it, and you know that it's got here, you're activating this, uh, essentially, okay, with an, Ig, with an IgG molecule. Basically, your immunoglobulin is acting like a peanut is the way that I sort of put it in my head to remember it. And then that's going to, in other words, as though it were a peanut, it's coming in here in its pocket. And then it's and then it's releasing it. That's how I remember it. I'm not, uh, you know, totally sold on the mechanism myself, but it's useful for test taking purposes. B overproduction of interferon gamma, yada yada. That's stage one cytokines. C overproduction of histamine. Well, you just you know that would be like an anaphylaxis kind of situation, right? But it's not, you know, that's not per se um, urticaria. And then D is defective. CD40 on B cells, you would never isotype switch. You never get IgE. So that's definitely not the right answer because um, you got to have IgE to have allergy. Always have to have IgE in the pool to have allergy. If your patient thinks they're allergic but there's not an increase in IgE, then, uh, then they say in immunology that that is not an allergy. Number 13, your patient suffers from chronic asthma. You enter them in a clinical trial with a new drug that targets what? Okay, so which of these deal with asthma? Again, this is memorization. Uh, so the A is IL-2. No, the answer, you know, let's just go through this, is, is IL-13. That's going to deal with it. The other sort of oddball would be an IL-33. Um, what else? IL-4, possibly, because IgE. IL-5, eosinophilia, if that was on there. But the others, interferon gamma, interferon alpha, and beta, no. Interferon alpha and beta, very important to remember these guys when you're talking about virus protection, okay? Because interferon alpha and beta increase, and, and this is a question that, you know, that always comes up because they want, they want us to know uh, essentially what aspect of the immune system is used to fight various bugs, okay? So a virus, you get interferon, uh, alpha and beta and gamma, right? They all increase MHC class 1. And so you got these MHC class 1s coming out here. And remember that this cell is infected, right? He's sad. He's a very sad cell. He's got a virus inside of him. And so theoretically, you've got some of this virus out here in the pocket, right? And along comes, da da da, your CD8 positive cell that was proliferated by our, none other than our favorite cytokines, Th1. And oh, by the way, it's even enhanced by IL2. Okay? So this process enables you to clear viruses. All right? So that's important to, to remember. Um, and again, it's the bad guy in here. Uh, that is that is recognized and that's increased. Uh, interferon gamma is different than interferon alpha and beta in that interferon gamma also increases the expression of MHC class 2 on your max uh, and your dendritic cells that 
well, I don't, I'm not making a very good, but you know, he has that beautiful starfish like cell. Okay. And also on your B cells. So that's interferon gamma. It makes them better antigen presenting cells because they have an increased number of MHC class two, therefore an increased chance that that T cell will see the little uh, goodie that's sticking in that MHC class two pocket. And then she will recognize it because she has a T cell receptor that matches it. And then she will proliferate wildly with cytokines that will grow that particular type of recognition molecule that'll go out and also activate macrophages to clear, um, you know, to clear up the mess as well. Okay, uh, let's see. Number 14, tissue biopsy of your patient shows an accumulation of large cytoplasmic granules. Your patient suffers from chronic infections due to Chediakigashi syndrome, a defect in fusion of the lysosome and phagosome. What is the genetic defect? Something else I should have put in the stem of the question that is often one of the only clues that they give you is that they, that they have very light hair, very light colored hair, and then very light complected. So this, the same lysosome uh, mechanism, lysosomal trafficking, that causes a lysosome and phagosome to fuse and to come together is also true for the melanosomes, you know, the pigmentation little guys. And so these uh, patients are, be you know, beautiful um, patients, but they suffer from, you know, lack of, of uh, melanin as well. So oftentimes that's how they describe them, white hair or fair complected. Because as you might well imagine, uh, you know, your macrophage ingests the bad guy, right, into his phagosome. So he's got him here. And then he fuses with the lysosome, which has all those goodies. Lysozyme, your armamentarium is sitting in that lysosome. So if you can't get these two guys together, you're not going to be able to get those reactive oxygen species to kill the bad guy, right? And to ultimately process the bad guy. So you're going to have, you know, some deficiency in your innate immunity. But the, uh, but the issue here is that you know, you might also think, well, it could be an ADPH oxidase because, again, that's not going to be able to, you know, have, uh, have those reactive oxygen species to kill the little guy or myeloperoxidase deficiency. But if in the stem of the question they give you that it's patients are very light complected, then you know straight away it's Chidiakagashi, it's a problem in list lysosomal trafficking uh, gene. And, and I just gave away the answer, which is the LYST gene. But let's go through what, what uh, would make the others correct. Chromosome 22 defect, that's to George, that's thymic aplasia, that's a T-cell defect, so that's going to be cell-mediated uh, deficiency, so that's going to be like TB and those kind of things. It's going to smell a lot like HIV, okay? Number B is chromosome uh, 814, I should have said translocation, that's Burkitt's lymphoma. And uh, so there's, there's African variation where you see a patient with a big sort of swollen, um, you know, swollen jaw, or there can also be, uh, you know, in the Western world, and it tends to manifest in the GI system. But the translocation, because this is worth talking about because it's often asked as well, the translocation is essentially what happens is you translocate a gene that's not particularly active next to a gene that is always active. So, um, so 814 translocation, essentially this uh, gene number 14, okay, is the gene that's responsible for the Ig heavy chain uh, proliferation. And guess what? That's always going to be active because you're always producing heavy chains for your, you know, for your antibodies and such. And so when Mr. A chromosome goes next to him, it's kind of like being in the wrong neighborhood. You know, it's like when you're around somebody who never sleeps kind of thing. And um, so he ends up being too active and that's how you end up with uh, Burkitt's lymphoma. All right. Uh, so where were we? We were at AIR, AIR. Remember that if you had a defect in AIR, remember that AIR, air protein, it's very cool. Uh, it's, it's sitting in, 
It's sitting in the thymus and it's the last stage before that little thym before that little T cell gets cleared to go out into the system. It's his little check ride. And at that point to see if he's ready, if he's going to attack himself and your other cells. And so that it exposes him to all the different tissues of the body to see if he's too, uh, too reactive in which case there's negative selection and he dies, okay, by, um, he dies straight away. So that's the ear. So if you had a defect in that, that means that your, your T cells, they got out of the thymus without really being tested against your own system, in which case they're going to go out and just start gobbling up and creating uh, immunopathology, too much immunity. So you would see a patient who had autoimmunity. BTK, we've talked about that a lot. That is part of B cell development, right? That's uh, that tyrosine kinase where you go from pro uh, to pre. It's sitting right here, BTK. Uh, and what happens is it stops at the pre cell. Now you're still going to have some B cells. Don't freak out if you see on the test that. That, there's, that your patient has B cells because you're thinking, wait a minute, it shouldn't have any, no. It, it can, there's some kind of a leak mechanism, they call it, where you will get some B cells, but you will clearly have a deficiency in B cell mediated immunity. So you're, you're gonna have a problem with, you know, being able to have immunoglobulins and you're gonna have a defective uh, response to, B, uh, to bacteria and, you know, anything, obviously some viruses as well. So, so that's what the problem is there. And it is X-linked, by the way. <clears throat> And the list gene is the right answer. We already went through that. Number 15 is your patient suffers from chronic bacterial and fungal um, infections. What is the likely defect? So they have bacterial and fungal infections. All right, so uh, let's look at the answers. Defect in beta-2 integrins, CD18, which is called LAD1, leukocyte adhesion defect. Okay, that sounds good because you got to be able to get into the tissue. Remember, the leukocytes have to adhese to get in there to fight these uh, bacteria and fungi. Okay, so that's true. B, defect in counter molecule for E-selectin, which is called LAD2. Remember that <clears throat> E-selectin, uh, you have P-selectin, which is prepped. <clears throat> and it's sitting there in the endothelium ready to go. And all it needs essentially is some histamine which is activated through that Hageman 2 calicrine. Calicrine splits uh, C5 into C5A, and there happens to be a tissue uh, mast cell hanging around, and voila, you have uh, histamine released, and we're off to the races in terms of E-selectin. Okay, so yes, if you had a problem with that process, that's, the, that's one of the very... Uh, that's P-selectin, sorry, that's P-selectin prepped. But then the next step is E-selectin. And so that's, that's your C-reactive protein process. And if you had a problem in that, then you would definitely not be able to, to start to roll. If you can't roll, you're never going to get to adhesion. And you're not going to be able to um, clear the bacterial and fungal infections. C, hyper-IgM. It's not the greatest answer because if you had I for IgM, what does it mean? That you can't isotype switch. So you don't have Ig, G, or E, or A, but you would have IgM. So it's probably not the best answer, and there's not an all of the above choice. Um, so it's A and B above, which is D. Number 16. In the case of an infection, oh, this, this is one of my personal favorites. Um, so in the case of an infection with mycobacterium leprae, the difference between tuberculoid leprosy versus leprominous leprosy comes down to a difference in what? Okay, so first of all, when I try to remember these two, when I see the word tuberculoid, anytime I see loid, you think, okay, it's a combining form that says sort of almost like, but not quite. So I always think that it's sort of like the light version. It's not as, it's not as bad as the real, you know, tuberculous or whatever. That's just the way I remember it. And then leprosy or lepromatous leprosy, that sounds pretty bad. Okay, so that's how you differentiate between which one of them is kind of okay and which one of them is really bad. So let's look at that. Number A is Th1 response in tuberculoid leprosy versus a Th2 response in lepromatous leprosy. And that's the, correct, uh, that's the correct answer. And I think we talked about that before. But essentially, um, like you say, that you need a Th1 response to clear, um, to clear 
intracellular pathogens and that's what we're talking about with mycobacterium they're very sneaky they get into the cell and they're able to basically you know stay in the cell and, ev and evade the phagosome lysosome you know killing and so they're kind of like one uh, podcast I heard I really liked said that they're like driving around the immune system like they've captured an enemy tank and they're just driving around and doing whatever they want and the only way this is this is critical when you get to pathology um, well we're, we're gonna come to that piece we'll, we'll stop that there but the important thing to remember is you gotta have the TH1 cytokine and we'll talk more about the mechanism in a minute um, and so A is the opposite of answers and A that's just testing your knowledge of that um, no it's it's you tuberculoid is not as bad as lepromatous leprosy and therefore um, in tuberculoid the patient has a th1 response and this is genetic it's not something that you can choose okay so like I was just as uh, I said you know with somebody who had leprosy a young boy who was brought from northern Sudan he had been uh, captured and and kept there and he was released and he came when he came down he had leprosy but he was given rifampin and, and uh, that's all they had you know dapsone is also a drug that they can give and he had gone from this sort of lioness type lepromatous features and morphed into a beautiful uh, beautiful young man and so he's doing very well with it but um, clearly he did not have that th1 response or he wouldn't have developed that full-blown leprosy in the first place C is deficiency in MAC. If you had a deficiency in that, you'd get Neisseria meningitis. And D is a deficiency in C3. If you didn't have C3, uh, then you're not going to be able to opsonize, right? And then you're certainly not going to be able to have the MAC complex either. But neither one of those are, are the correct answer. Number 17, your patient shows a high level of CEA. Okay, so CEA is a carcino embryonic um, antigen okay and this could indicate what so there's some there's some different you know in immuno class they'll throw out some of these extra things that they want to teach you so this is one of them and they're sort of so-called tumor markers and this is just about memor memorizing which tumor marker goes with which particular cancer but to remember before you go into that is that tumor markers are non you know non-specific essentially the the best way that they're used is to monitor whether your cancer has come back okay so a lot of people could have an increase in CEA for example if you're a smoker cigarette use will increase CEA and COPD will increase CEA so it's not specific to to cancer um, and the, but the cancer that they tend to monitor with it is called is uh, is colon cancer so a recurring colon cancer could indicate or B primary cancer either one so the answer would be um, the answer would be E A or B above primary testicular cancer so in this case there's different markers for testicular cancer alpha beta protein is one of them um, so that could make that true there's another marker beta hcg as we know from pregnancy so if you have a choriocarcinoma you would see an increase in beta hcg again these are just memorization questions that are often asked Finally, number 18, your patient is not able to make J chains, speaking of memorizing, uh, this immunoglobulin deficiency would affect what? So it's just a matter of which ones have the J chains, and the answer is E, I, G, M, and I, G, A. Thank you very much.